There we go. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but my notepad has shrunk. But ironically, I have more to say. Anyway, I don't know. Cold opens. They're tough. All right, here we go. Um, <clears throat> Henry Schlinger, Jr. I don't know if Brad's trying to mess with me here, folks, but he's doing some awful interesting behaviors behind the camera. Um, <laughs> don't play with your lilacs, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a rule, folks. And this article is about rule following. <laughs> Sorry, rule govern, rule behave, whatever. The, I'm like, I don't even know. <laughs> oh, I don't know what time it is. All I know is I'm food deprived. And because my business partner says you can't eat past midnight, it's kind of like a surgery thing. And he says, you'll find out in the morning. He says, read this article. I said, okay, I'll read the article. And why I'm doing all that under rules, I don't know. So anyway, here we go. If, if you gathered the fact that maybe this article is about rules, maybe. Um, is there a reason you have pretzels? You're trying to get me to engage in behavior. You deprived me. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, there's the, it's not really a joke, okay? Because I'm salivating more than what I normally would at the present. Like, I can't even talk because I'm so damn hungry. Beside the point, would you stop? Can I get at least into the article before you start to give us the example? All right. So, Schlinger, 93. Hank, Henry, whatever you want to say. Um, junior. So, um, this is a great article, as they all are, because published. Um, separating discriminative and function-altering effects of verbal stimuli. And for those of you that actually believe what I just said about every article is great because it's published, you know I'm full of beep. Um, let's see, this was in the Behavior Analyst, so it's got to be great. Because anything by a Behavior Analyst is better than anything else, because we all know this. All right, anyway, so rules. So this article is long and rather difficult, um, but it's good, and I like it. Um, I, I, and if I didn't like it, I wouldn't be presenting it to you, because I picked it. Um, <laughs> oh, food. All right, here we go. So, rule. You might have heard me go off sometime on, if you've ever met me in person, I've probably gone off on about rule following versus rule governed behavior, uh, and what is a rule, blah, 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 and it's really the only part of verbal behavior I actually really like. Uh, most of the rest of verbal behavior, including all the Skinner stuff, nit, like, whatever, like, not my thing. Um, so Brad's really good with it, so um, that's why when you see verbal behavior, you usually see videos from him, um, because he understands it and I don't. Um... You know, we can go through this whole article, but it's a pretty in-depth. So let's just look at some of the core pieces here, all right? Um, so you do, if you've got your Skinner text, if you've read Verbal Behavior, it is useful to have read that and understand it in order to understand what's going on in this article, okay? He does refer back to some pieces in there that are useful. So rule, the first off, the question that we're gonna really going to work at here is, is there a discrimination effect or is there a function altering effect? And by function altering, I literally don't mean changing the function of a behavior. I mean changing the function of stimuli. Okay? So, for example, the moment that you reinforce someone, the moment that a reinforcer becomes a reinforcer, that stimulus has changed. It now has reinforcing properties. The value of it, the function of that stimulus is now different. The moment you use classical conditioning, so you take a neutral stimulus, you pair it to a condition with, a condi uh, with, a, uh, with an unconditioned stimulus, that neutral stimulus changes its function. Right? So, what that, so when he's talking about function changes uh, so d versus discrimination, this is what he's getting at. Is the stimulus changing? Is the function changing of those words when they when they basically become a rule, or is a rule simply a discrimination? So don't go near there, which is a reference to one of my favorite movies. Um, so <laughs> I can't, I, because the movie was recorded in the '80s, I can't say the rest of the movie because it would be drastically offensive to everyone else out there. But the next line is brilliant. Thank you, Robin Williams. Um, so is a rule just a verbal discriminative stimulus? Fair question. And this article basically argues that that's the way everybody treats it, including maybe Skinner. Maybe. 
So anyway, beside the point. Um, so if a rule is just a verbal descriptive stimulus, then what the heck's the point in coming up with the term rule? Because you already have a term for it. Discriminative stimulus. <laughs> like, you don't need the extra word. And not only do you not need the extra word, you don't even need special research. Because why? We already know about SDs. And we're going to go into a little bit about SDs with the Jack Michael article at another time. Um, so, so we talked about function altering operations um, instead of thinking of these as discriminative stimulus. And this article is presenting kind of that bigger picture, right? Of, listen, this probably isn't just SDs. There may be some situations where verbal behaviors are SDs. And, and I don't really want to get into all that, but because that's not the surprise. The surprise is that the function altering operation of this stuff. So Skinner identifies in, 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 in verbal behavior um, that rules are really also about contingency specifying stimuli. So it's CSSs. <laughs> Cascading style sheets. Why? Like acronyms. Wow. Like people that are like into. Yeah. Anyway, I, I get. I get. Sometimes I have troubles with all the acronyms. Um, so conting, contingency specifying stimuli are rules. Those rules are function altering um, stimuli. Okay. So if we think about it that way, it makes more sense. So it's challenging to distinguish between CSSs and SDs when we're talking about verbal behavior. It's very challenging. And it, there's no really clean way to know which one's which. Um, and in order to really get into that, you really got to get into what the definition of an SD is. And to get into the definition of an SD, we got to go into some other research because with the way we all talk about SDs, even in a professional pseudo colloquial sense, we probably all talk about them wrong. And, uh, you know, uh, just to give you a little bit, you know, it's, we're talking a lot about Jack Michael on SDs and he died yesterday. Like, so there's like, this is kind of a little, the irony of these planned videos was that we're talking about Jack Michael the day after his death. And that's like really sad because the field is like, man, he was awesome. So anyway, some of the stuff that Jack Michael was talking about, I keep looking over at the article cause I want to grab it. Uh, but, um, talked about how do you actually identify what is a descriptive stimulus and some of it's not as easy as just it comes before behavior reliably that <laughs> that's not that's not enough so when we're talking about verbal behavior we're going to run into the same problem is it actually descriptive stimulus um or is it does it or do these words have a um uh, what is it contingency specifying stimuli within them and a contingency specifying stimuli would be like ryan don't eat that i'm just looking for a battery ryan don't eat the phone you'll get sick right so eat there's the behavior um and the consequence of eating the phone getting sick right so if i eat the phone i'm gonna get sick so contingency specifying stimuli so don't eat the phone don't touch the hot plate don't step out of your car while it's moving and record videos because you might get run over <laughs> um, people are gonna do it anyway um let's see there's a whole bunch of things blah 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 one of the things that we get into here is the implications of failing to identify this stuff properly um, gets you to focus on the wrong piece. And one of the pieces that you focus on is rule governed behavior, right? Uh, which leads only to the SD type effects of rule governed behavior. Because you're thinking with the rule governs it. So it governs it, it comes first, and blah, blah, blah. And that's just hooey, right? Um, the note that I made here about this is that we should not give verbal behavior special status simply because they're verbal or verbal stimuli sorry so verbal stimuli are just stimuli folks it's just stimuli right the happen that they happen to form words um, and have some other things associated with them is the realm of what verbal behavior is all about um but anyway we also run into a big reification uh potential here uh, where you're creating something that isn't necessarily there out of the rule, right? Um, and that you're specifically following some hypothetical construct called a rule. Anyway, it's one of the problems. Methodological problems. Uh, how do you ask questions about rule following or rule governed behavior? Um, if you're focusing on the discriminative function of a rule versus the, um, versus the function altering effect of the rule, then... <laughs> then your, your research questions are going to be drastically different, right? Um, so in in the literature, according to Schlinger, Schlinger, we always talk, it's almost always referred to as a discriminative effect, um, but 
oftentimes it might actually be a function altering effect, right? So anyway, developmental course of uh, oh, um, that seems to have a developmental issue with it. Um, so the younger you are, uh, the younger you are, the more likely it is you're just talking about SDs. Uh, or that the rules are more associated with SDs if you're describing your environment. Um, and as you get older, you'll be more likely to, to do um, CSSs. Um, so I kind of wanted to get in. Oh, that's Michael A2. <laughs> Small. All right, so let me give you an example of a function altering example using this. I can give you an example <laughs> of a function altering function altering example. Here we go. So I've been food deprived. We already talked about that. It was by accident and not at the same time. Um, so I am food seeking behavior, and literally my mouth is watering at the moment because Brad is messing with a thing of pretzels. These are Vero pretzels. They're actually pretty good. Glut, glut, glutino, gluten free big pretzels. Okay. So oh, he's gonna throw one to me. I caught it. Very good. Um, all without a rule. No, nope, maybe there was one. Or just SD. No, it was a motivation. He's messing with motivations. So, oh, a bit hard. Yeah, I think those are poison. Yeah, I'm gonna go for the poison. There's still a little bit left. Oh, fuck it. Come back, anyway. It's slightly unprofessional, but hopefully it makes the point. Hmm. Ooh, leftovers. Uh, even better. All right. So the point being that, oh, that was really good. Actually, those are surprisingly good pretzels, folks. And this is not an advert for whatever pretzels is where they're surprisingly good for being gluten-free. Um, anyway, what was I getting at? I am so damn hungry. Food deprived. Okay, so food deprived, right? It's going to be a motivating operation. It's going to get me to search for food. Like, I'm going to be more likely to search out for food and eat it. Um, but did you notice that with one single word, a rule was created and followed? The word was poison. Thank you. So, and I don't mean the band. <laughs> As he's going, nah, 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 nah. Um, every rose has its thorn. So, anyway. Um, so uh, the it's like before that girl's poison bit. What? Your point. Oh, you went you. <laughs> oh, you went boys to men. Is that boys to men? No, that I can't remember. Poison. Yeah, it's not boys to men. Not boys to girls. I can't remember. Back to the video. Yeah. We'll talk about music for a while. Exactly. Yeah. You can sing. I can. He sings. Um. Evocative effect. So, uh, wow. Sorry. So the poison. One one word is all it took. Right. Instead, he didn't describe all of the contingencies that were at play. Right. Um, if you eat that, you're going to get sick because it's po poison. One word, which is not built to develop. Right. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. BBD. <laughs> Take a brief moment for '90s music, remembering how awesome it was. All right. There we go. So let's get back to poison. <laughs> I know that song is so stuck in my head. All right, so evocative effect um, of the food deprivation is gone with one word. That's what's cool about the function altering effect of rules. Okay, I put rules in quotes because I hate them. Um, but anyway, the, the, this word, this particular stimulus, um, changed the value uh, or ch change the stimulus itself, change food itself to the point to where even though I'm food deprived and motivation is all established, I spit the food out. Now, obviously we're joking, um, but you get the point. So that, that example of poison is taken from the article um, and it uses, it uses that as a point to show you that the particular word poison is definitely not a discriminative um, stimulus in that particular example, but it has a major impact on behavior. And also because it doesn't have all of the components of a CSS, um, the question then becomes, how in the world is it actually working? So this is a great little article, uh, not little, uh, but I do want you to remember there's a couple of things about it um, that, that it's, we don't know, at least at the time of this article, right? We just don't understand all this stuff. And I think this is where relational frame theory is going and starting to get into the more complex analyses of um, verbal behaviors, uh, or whatever you want to say. Um, but the thing that I don't like about rule-governed behavior is that there's not this hypothetical construct of a 
rule floating around actually governing your behavior. Um, I like to think of it as rule following behavior. Now, Slinger argues that maybe that's not the best way to go because it implies the organism has, it, it implies some sort of cognitive experience in the organism. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. Um, you can be reinforced for following rules or you can not be reinforced for following rules. Like, I might follow Brad's rules, but not the dog's rules. You know what I mean? I mean, the, from we my perspective. both ate the pretzel. What's that? We both ate the pretzel. Yeah, we all ate the pretzel, actually, before the, you know, ugh. Oh, okay. I'm wrapping up. So, rule following behavior to me is a thing. Um, this article gets into more about the differences between discriminative effects and function altering effects of words um, that would be used as rules. So, there you go.